Hey there, and welcome to Camera Dads, episode two, 10,000 images. I am Phil, and with me, as always, is my brother. Hey, everyone. I'm Simon. Thanks for joining us for the second episode of Camera Dads. We really appreciate you listening. And today we're going to be talking about uh, software that Phil and I use to store photos, maybe some editing photos, but not so much. Um, mostly it's storing and organi organizing photos because like most uh, people who take photos, he and I have a lot of photos to sort through. So that's what we're going to get to in general. And uh, got some listener feedback we'll get to. Got some questions about last week's show we'll get to. So thanks for joining us on this ride. Um, to get right in this, Phil, you take a lot of photos with your DSLR. Yeah, yes. And your, I sure do. And your Android phone. What do you use to store all your photos? All right. So... For the years, I have tried many different um, photo management techniques, different tools, actual pieces of software. But ultimately, what I have settled on uh, is simply storing the photos directly on my computer. Um, I happen to use a Mac, and uh, I have a folder called Pictures. Inside there, I have folders named 1999, 2000, etc., so you're you're taking a real hands-on approach. Yes, I take complete control of this. And the the reason I do that is because um, I have been personally dissatisfied with using another piece of software to be in charge of my photos because I want to know where they actually are. Phil, and, and, by the way, that's for just those me. Listening, Phil's a programmer. He has a degree in computer science. <laughs> He's been a programmer for most of his life um so phil is very much of a i am gonna do it myself kind of uh that that's your your attitude towards some of these things yes yes that's good <laughs> i even have uh, uh i have a little bit of python script that i wrote that moves photos around from my dropbox folder to somewhere else that i'll probably talk to at some point okay talk about but uh the the general gist is that i I feel like I'm giving up control when I'm using another piece of software, let's say iPhoto, which was huge for me when it came out. Yes, I use um, iPhoto as well. So I used iPhoto for a long time until I didn't, until I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, uh, my technique is to store the photos on my computer by year, month, and then each month just holds hundreds or thousands of photo files okay so when you're talking photos on your computer are, are these photos that you've taken with your dslr or your mobile phone both because i know you take a lot of with your phone too yep so you, you 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 literally like pop in your memory card to your imac and and drag and drop the photos to a folder is that right yes well I'll take the memory card out of the camera put it in the mac and then have Two windows open. What? One, one got the memory card. <laughs> one's got. This is super manual. <laughs> this is. <laughs> Ain't no software gonna touch your photos. <laughs> one's got the memory card. One's got the photos folder, and I grab all the ones that are taken inside of a certain month and drag them over to where they belong. This is fascinating. I had no idea. So, wh <laughs> why such a manual approach? Because some some listeners yeah. out there are gonna say, "Well, Phil." There's software that can do all that for you. Why Why are you doing this yourself? And to be honest, I'm kind of saying that here. Why Why are you doing this? That's, that's fair. That's fair. The reason that I do it myself and my wife would chuckle is because I have to have the ability to control everything and the ability to tinker with it. Okay. Yep. She's I, in the other room and she just left. So when you say um, control and tinker with... Um, you, you're not an editor so much. You don't get into Photoshop and light. I'm really and not. And that's where you and I are a bit different. But so when um, you say edit and tinker with, what do you mean? I mean with the photo storage system. Oh, so not the photos themselves. Not the photos themselves. Nope. You, you, if I'm getting this right, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you want to know where every picture is on your computer. And I want to know where every picture is okay. on the computer. Do you rename them also? No. Okay. And I, I probably don't do things the way that 
a lot of people would. This sounds like you, Phil. The way that most people would, but yeah, it's it's the system that I've come up with. I've been doing it for years, and it works really well. Um, but that's that's only for storing the photos. That's not for viewing them or editing them or anything else. That oh. I, I kind of look at that as a completely separate package. But okay. be- before I talk about that, yeah, I want to hear what your thoughts are and how you handle this because you take Good question thousands of photos and a year, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. and you don't do this the same way. No, not at all. Um, I take a, I, I had kind of a similar approach as you for a long time. I used iPhoto. If I think back to my first digital camera, um, which was a long time ago, like 10 years ago or whatever, I used iPhoto like you did. And mm-hmm. I let iPhoto do everything. And then Apple killed off iPhoto. I bought a program called Aperture, which was like the pro version of iPhoto. And then now I use Lightroom for about the past three years. And all of those have a common thread, which is I didn't have to do anything. I just put in my memory card. (laughs) And whether it was iPhoto, Aperture, or Lightroom, the computer took care of all of it for me. Okay, let me me ask you a question. Okay. When, what happens when you take the memory card out of your camera, you put it in the computer, what do you do? Um, I, so now as a user of, of Lightroom, and I'm, I mean like a heavy user of Lightroom, I use Lightroom all the time and I've written articles on Lightroom. I'm a huge Lightroom convert. Um, so when I take my memory card, I pop it in my iMac, I go to Lightroom, I click the import dialog, I apply a preset if I want. And usually I do, I shoot in raw. And so I cook all of my images according to a couple different presets. And they adjust uh, color balance. They adjust black level, white level, saturation, um, sharpening, lens correction. And then Lightroom takes the photos off my memory card. Well, it copies the photos from my memory card into somewhere on my computer. I don't know where. (laughs) See, that's that's where it it breaks down for me. It leaves the memory card totally untouched. Okay. Then I take the memory card, put it in my computer, put it in my camera, format the memory card and I'm ready to go again. So you actually erase the photos. (laughs) You use your camera to do that. Yeah. um, The the relationship between a camera and a memory card is a sacred relationship. Um, The Nikon, Canon, all the camera manufacturers have a certain um, file format that they like to use. They have a certain folder structure they like to use, naming convention. And if you are doing things on the memory card, deleting photos on the memory card, then the camera over time can start to get a little wonky with how it interacts with the memory card. So I, I format my memory cards a couple times a week because every time I'm done with them in my computer, I put in my camera and give my camera a brand new memory card. So it lessens the chance of some sort of error happening where the camera writes a file and let's say uh, I'm at image number 9,999 and it flips back over to 0001. There could be a conflict if I've tried to manually erase a photo before that was labeled 0001. It just lessens the, it lessens the opportunity for something to go wrong. But back to what you said, I don't know where the photos are on my computer. I know where they are in Lightroom Okay. But I don't have any okay. idea what they're on the computer, nor do I care. I just want them to show up in Lightroom, which they always do. So it's sort of the opposite. Okay. And I, is, I'm discovering is, here. Yeah. We're taking a, an opposite approach here. Yeah, I'm full hands on and you're full hands <laughs> off. Now, there, okay, so something you just reminded me of, and this was a situation I ran into some years ago. Mm-hmm. Um my camera at one point, um, which is Nikon, uh, well, right now it's a Nikon D three thousand two hundred, and before I, no, it might have been it might have been this one that it was that this problem was okay was with. Um, every time I reinserted the memory card, it would start out at number zero or number one again. Yeah, and the problem that I ended up with because I take such a hands on approach is that. 
if I took, I don't know, 10 photos one day and then dumped those on the computer and then a week later took 20 more photos and then dumped those, 10 of them would be, have the same file name. Okay, I could see why this, that would be a problem. The sound, <laughs> like you, you understand, like they because they yeah. started at D zero 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 one or something. Yeah, and and my thing is, I don't care what they're named, and a lot of them do have the same name. I care where they show up in my Lightroom catalog, and I've got the Lightroom catalog organized by date, but also by photo session. So, if I'm, uh, I also, for those of you who don't know, I, I have a side hobby called Stevens Creek Photography. And it's my wife and I, and we do family and child and, and high school senior photos. So I have my Lightroom catalog organized by date and by photo session as well. And it also does facial recognition, which I don't use that much, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And, and if, you, if you're taking a manual hands-on approach, having a bunch of files enabled um, 004.jpg, would be a big problem and I can certainly understand that. Yeah. What I, what I ultimately found that was a setting in the camera somewhere and I, I wasn't prepared for this cause it just occurred to me, but um, maybe I'll go and dig it up and put it on the website when later on. But there's a setting that, t that tells the camera to go all the way to either 1000 or 10,000 and yeah, then I think it's 10,000 for those cameras. So unless I take more than 10,000 photos in a month, I'm fine. Because oh, because you start everything by month, month by month. By month is the smallest interval that I do. Okay. So well, you know, this actually brings up a, a listener question we had emailed. There was a, a gentleman named Gary. He wrote in um, with a question for this week's episode. He said, um, "I'm currently doing all my file management in Windows Explorer, which sounds a lot like what you're doing, Phil." Yes, I'm um, very curious, Gary, to to find out if how similar our tactics are. Uh, he said uh, he says he's too nervous to make the jump into doing this 100% Lightroom. Any tips would be greatly appreciated. And my answer to Gary is the same as my answer is for a lot of things. Um, if you're doing something that works, then keep doing it. And whether, whether it's the car you drive or the computer you use or whatever, if it works for you, then by all means, keep doing it. Um, I would say to someone like Gary, if you want to make the jump into Lightroom, it's kind of daunting at first, but once you get the hang of it, if it meets your needs, I I think you'd really like it. And if you're looking for tips, um, my, my suggestion would be to do some reading online. There's a lot of great articles that walk you through step-by-step -step and videos on YouTube of how to import your photos, how to manage the catalog, and, and organize your collection. You don't even have to use Lightroom for editing. You can just use it for organizing. But Phil, what would you say to someone like Gary? Um, I'm Gary, I'd be curious to know what your apprehension is about. Um, it sounds very similar to me in the way that I've been in the past where um, I want to maintain that control over the file structure the, the way things are organized. And if I were to use Lightroom, um, I would use it on top of the way that I currently manage my photos. And Phil actually owns Lightroom, to be clear on this. That's true. You know, I own it. Enough. I have used it a little bit. Um, and it's legit. You own a I... legitimate copy. <laughs> it's, it's paid for. It's but, paid for. Uh, um, because I don't do much editing, which is where you and I differ mm -hmm. quite a bit, mm -hmm. I don't tend to use Lightroom. I don't use it for viewing photos or organizing them. Occasionally, I'll use it to maybe do some touch-up work and do some exports for prints that I'm going to get done. Um, or my wife, we, my wife may do that in, in Lightroom. Um, but for the most part, I don't use it. But it's a very powerful tool. And so Gary, if you want to use Lightroom for, I guess, man, I guess it depends on what you want to do with it. That's a good, because that's you a good can, point, Phil. You can use Lightroom for a couple things. You can use it to organize your photos where Lightroom will make, you can make collections and, and uh, albums within Lightroom and you can view them in there and they will still leave your, actual file structure untouched. 
Yeah, and I think so, that's one of the, the key benefits of Lightroom is it doesn't alter whatever photos you have on your computer. It doesn't move your photos, doesn't change your photos. It doesn't even edit your photos. It stores instructions for what it will do when you make an edit to your photo. And then if you export the edited version, it will create a new copy. But your original photos, um, and this is for Gary or anyone like him who is interested in Lightroom, it doesn't ever change your originals. So if nothing else, you can give it a try, but know that all of your existing uh, file structure and everything else is fully intact. Yeah, that's probably the best answer I could give them is, is go ahead and try it because you've got the safety net there that everything you've already done, whatever your file management in Windows Explorer technique is, um, you've already got that done and Lightroom will not touch any of that. So I'd say go ahead and give it a try uh, and, and, and see. Well, well see so if there's a, a question I want to ask you. Um, there's a lot of people who are probably listening to this podcast and they might not have a DSLR. Maybe they take a lot of photos with their phone. And what do you do to organize your photos on mobile? I know we've talked a lot about desktop, but um, how do you deal with mobile? Well, and, let me answer that by saying the tool that I use to organize and view and uh, even do minor editing and exporting um, is Google Photos. And as long as it's still around. into your phone? Knock on wood, Google will keep that product. <laughs> um, so here's what happens on mobile. Uh, Google Photos and, is... And would you say, um, is this... You have an Android phone, yep. right? Okay. I, I have can, an Android phone. And I think you can get... Google Photos for Apple. Yes. Or iOS. Okay. Yes. I, I don't use Google Photos, so I'm, I'm trusting you on this. Okay. Yes, you can get Google Photos for an, uh, an Apple iPhone or pretty much any Android phone. And for the most part, it just replaces or sits alongside your standard gallery or photo viewer app. But the big thing about it is that uh, it's really good at organizing your photos and it's really good at uploading those photos to the cloud, to Google's backend, so that you can access them online. So when you say organizing, does it name them or put them in it folders? Doesn't, no, it doesn't name them, but you, you, uh, you can look at them in a broad view, like by year, and then you can very easily pinch down in or zoom in and get a month or a day or an event like um, trip to Springfield, it'll do a lot of that organization all by itself so, so you that you do don't it. have to. <laughs> That's exactly right. So that the user doesn't have to do it. And that might be a good solution for someone who takes a lot of photos with their phone. As I understand it, um, Google, by using Google Photos, you're, you're uploading your photos to your Google account in the cloud. It keeps a backup on your phone, but it analyzes the photos for location and even objects. So I could search for pumpkin. And even though I haven't typed pumpkin in like the file name of my photos, it would still find photos with pumpkins in them. Yes. And it does all that. I believe it does all that in the cloud. And then that data gets pushed. Well, it may not get pushed back down to the device. It may all do it when you're when you're searching, but you can do the same thing then on your phone. You don't have to use Google Photos online at all. Um, if, you're, if you're just using your phone and you want to type in pumpkin, you type in pumpkin and you'll find all the photos of the pumpkin right there on the phone without going. And they've been automatically photos. sorted for you. Right. They've been automatically figured out that there's a pumpkin in those photos. Okay. Um, for me, because I maintain that meticulous level of control, I combine Google Photos and Dropbox. And Dropbox is oh, another good one as far as we, storing and archiving your photos. <laughs> um, so if there's two recommendations I could make for someone who's looking to take a lot of photos on a phone and having a reliable backup of those photos, it's Google Photos and or Dropbox. Because the Dropbox app for iPhone or Android allows you to automatically back up any photos or videos that you take 
to your Dropbox storage. So if you have... Um, and you're talking to dropbox.com service. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, if, if you have just a free Dropbox account, um, I think that's one gig or two gigs, I forget. Um, but even the the priced plans aren't very much. Um, but the, the Google Photos is completely free. If you... They have a paid option too, but you can have unlimited storage there for free. And it, it compresses the photos slightly, but they say that you can't tell. And I don't think, I don't think you can tell. Okay. So my suggestion is that you use one or both of those so that when you take photos on your phone, they'll automatically get backed up because one thing that one concern and a problem that I've run into before, before the days of smartphones, but still camera phones is what happens when you lose your phone mm -hmm. or you move to a new phone. You know, I, um, so I have an iPhone and um, I I use a program called Photos, which is it's just built into an iPhone. And I know I could get Google Photos, but I have kind of a, a uh, I'm not a huge fan of Google. And so I like to do uh, other solutions like the Apple Photos program on my iPhone. And what you said about backing up your photos, because what happens if you lose your phone? Um, Apple not too long ago addressed this by doing a, a, um, uh, some sort of system. I don't know what it's called, but basically when I take a photo on my phone, it uploads the, the original photo to my iCloud account and it keeps a low res version on my phone, a super tiny low res version. Then if uh, you come over to my house, Phil, and I want to show you some photos of the kids playing in the treehouse it will on the fly download the high res version of that file, but the original okay. is in my okay. iCloud. The problem though is those photos take up space. Unlike Google Photos, which I think you said gives you unlimited storage. It does, yep. iCloud does not. Um, I think you get five gigabytes, which is pretty pretty bad, and I wish Apple were better about this. I pay 99 cents a month for Apple's um, 50 gigabyte plan, and Okay. That's a lot of iPhone photos. I, I don't think I'll run out anytime soon. And if I do, I guess I'll, I don't know, move them off my iCloud or something. But I don't want to be limited in the photos I'm taking just because I was too cheap to spend a dollar a month on 50 gigs of storage. And it's kind of the price you pay for living in the Apple ecosystem. I, I think Google's got a good solution as well. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah. think to anyone listening, if you're taking photos with your phone, whether it's iPhone or Android, you got to find a way to back those things up. And I know people who are parents who have a lot of photos of their kids, but don't have them backed up. And so they drop their phone in the pool and they lose all of their photos. So find a way to back them up, whether it's Google Photos or iCloud. And if you run out of space, spend a dollar a month. Uh, but man, it's so critical. You lose those photos and you're kicking yourself for the rest of your life because you didn't pack them up somehow. I, I support that a hundred percent. Um, I've, d I've had to be in the unfortunate position of trying to help someone, a friend or a family member with, um, recovering lost photos, <laughs> um, yeah. either from a, from a bad hard drive or from, you know, I, here's my old phone. How do I get these onto my new phone? And mm. man, that is not, it is not as easy as it should be. But now it, things are becoming much easier because the services like, like Google photos, Apple photos, Dropbox, probably, um, Flickr is another one. Um, th they do automatic backups for you. So you take a picture and a few minutes later or less, you know, it, it's got back up. It's, it's been backed up. So yeah, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned Flickr. I actually use Flickr quite a bit and they also have, I think they give you a terabyte of storage. So it's not unlimited, but it's pretty unlimited. Uh, a, ter a terabyte is essentially unlimited. Yeah. yeah. At this point, and someone out there might be thinking, what about Photoshop? Well, Photoshop is not for organizing photos or backing up photos. Photoshop is a whole other topic. So if you're listening right now and you're thinking, well, I don't use Lightroom. I want to use Photoshop. Um, use Photoshop for editing images, but it has nothing to do with organizing or sorting. There's a program called Adobe Bridge, which takes care of some of that. But really, um, if you want to, it, 
use a desktop program. Lightroom is great. There's, um, uh, there was a program called Picasa, which Google abandoned, and I'm still slightly bitter about that, which is one reason I'm not a big fan of Google. They like to develop things, and then they just sort of cast them to the wind after they're done with them. Um, but uh, Apple, if you're on a Mac, Apple has a program called Photos, which basically is the same thing as their photos on an iPhone, and it's their modern replacement for iPhoto, which they used to have back in the day. I think Photos is not very good because it is severely limiting in a lot of ways, but it is good for just basic storing and organization. I, in Aperture, or I'm sorry, in Lightroom, I have smart albums where it creates albums on the fly based on data in my photos, whether it's faces or um, uh, if I've flagged certain photos as like five star photos I really like, it'll put those automatically in an album. Um, I create a monthly, a month by month uh, catalog of my photos and I have it do that automatically. So in 2016, I've got a folder for each month and I can click into the March folder of 2016 and see all my photos from March. So that matches my manual yes. photo story. Yes, structure. it's exactly yeah. what you do, um, except... Lightroom does it all for me. I don't do it myself. And so I have to basically trust that Lightroom is doing it. Yeah. And then within that within that folder, that March 2016, I have several photos marked as five stars or flagged or rejected. And keep in mind, the, the photos are still on my hard drive. I haven't done anything to those. But I can instantly search in Lightroom for photos that I really like, photos that I've marked with yearbook that we're going to print in a yearbook. Um, but that's one reason I like Lightroom. And again, like go back, if we go back to Gary's question, whatever works for you, <laughs> I, I'm a fan of that. So I'm not here to change anyone's mind. I'm just saying this is what I do. And I find it super handy, especially now that I've we've had kids for five years and I've taken tons of photos. I, I think organizing this would make sense to me. But if, if it's um, a manual system like you, Phil, then that's fine too. It's whatever works for the person. Yeah, I, I think I think the combination of of manual slash something like Lightroom sitting on top of it that will do some album creation for you um, or organization for you, I think that's a that's a really good solution. Um, whereas you use Lightroom, I use Google Photos pretty much online for that sort mm -hmm. of thing, and it will automatically make albums for me based on oh, it looks like you were out of town for three days. Well. Uh, okay, so he was uh, at the lake. All right, so I'm going to automatically make an album called At the Lake, March 2017 or something like that, and it'll do that for me. And that's something that I think there's a mental block for me. I That's where I step in and I say, no, no, I want control. I don't want Google making a photo album of my most precious memories, but then I never get around to doing it. Exactly. So, you never you never get around to doing it. And yeah. most of the time, so I used to think the same thing. Most of the time, I'll find that the stuff Google does for me is plenty good. It's good mm -hmm. enough to to bring back up. Um, and and maybe that's, uh, meant that's like, I just need to get over this. <laughs> and the the, the artificial intelligence is going to take over this for you, and you'll never have to do a thing again. Uh, a couple other other things I want to mention, and then we got some some uh, lister. Yeah, yeah. Mail to get to. Um, one thing I like about Google Photos is, and I use this this a lot. I never, I didn't really think I would, but it 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 makes animations for you, um, animated gifs for you automatically of I think five or more photos that are taken in sequence. Okay. So, um, an example is we've got an eight month old. And we've had a really nice weather lately. So we've been in the backyard. I put her in her swing and I'll give her a little push. And then I can take my phone, do a burst shot, my phone, and do a burst shot, get 30 pictures. And then after Google has had time to process those, it'll say, hey, we made a little animation for you. And it's just this little animated GIF oh, of her. Cool. Back and forth this yeah. And I didn't do anything. Nothing to make that happen not bad it just does it and so i found myself using that a lot so one of the kids is dancing doing something silly all right i'll bust it out i'll take a burst shot and then 
you know, I get this fun little animation of them. And I think that's, as far as having something fun and sharing, that's a great, great thing. The only downside to that is that I end up with the burst photos that still get stuck there. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I will, I will create that animation and then go back and select the photos and delete them. See, I'll take my, uh, my Nikon, put it on burst mode, um, take several photos in succession. Then later on, I'll put the memory card on my computer, put them in Lightroom, edit them. I'll get uh, a bunch of raw files. I'll save them if I want to. And then I've I'll fallen asleep by this time because I'm just not yeah. going to keep up yeah. with all that. But <laughs> Exactly. Or your um, kids have come into the room and, and distracted you. Right. Um, I want to ask, uh, something that you mentioned earlier and, and uh, we have to get to, uh, we got to wrap this up pretty soon too, but you mentioned prints. What mm -hmm. about physical prints? And that's, uh, it, the, the topic of the show is organizing and storing images. Well, what about storing images physically in a book or on the wall? Is that something you do? Yes. Um, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because I think that in the modern day, people rely too heavily on digital photos and on things like some people have these digital photo frames. Uh, you know, you stick a memory card yeah, in there and it'll add for Christmas uh, ago. Yeah. Um, but one thing that my wife and I have done for the last several years, that I have to admit that we skipped last year, didn't skip, we haven't done it last year, but we will go through. Um, the thousands of photos that we take in the course of a year and make a photo book from um, like Shutterfly mm -hmm. is one of the services. And there's, there's tons of them out there. Apple's photos. iPhoto used to let you do this. It probably still does where you can go in there and order super nice, fancy printed you know, and um, books. We, and so we do that too. And we are uh, still working on our album from 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we do the same thing once a year. And now we have, uh, I think three or four photo albums, like high school yearbooks almost. Yeah. And if you keep up on that, it's really cool because, um, we made, we made one every year for a couple of years and then we took a trip to Colorado one summer. And so we made another book just of that trip. And so on the coffee table, you know, um, we've got these books sitting there and if, if company is over or grandma and grandpa come by and you want to say, let's take a look at those pictures. You don't have to go and turn on the Apple TV and go to the right yeah. channel and load up and your album. It's like, look at this. This is a book. Do you remember, do you remember prints? You remember Polaroids? There's something just about the tangible beautiful. experience of holding a picture yeah. that is, I think it's almost ingrained in us where if I can hold it, I can make a connection to it better than if I can just see it on a screen. And we see this with kids all the time. Kids are, are tactile beings. Well, humans are. And if I show a picture of my kids, uh, if I show pictures on the, uh, the computer to them, they, that's great. But if I show them a physical picture, they want to hold that. And then they ask about it and it, they, they want to put it up on the wall. But there's something about the experience of holding a physical picture and being able to physically flip through a book that I think speaks to us as human beings on like some sort of fundamental psychological level. And I, I would recommend the same thing and don't spend too much time worrying about, do I use Shutterfly? Do I use MPix? What about uh, the built-in one at Lightroom or iPhoto? Just do it. Just and get they, it done. Yeah. yeah. They've all got Walgreens will even do it. You can you yeah, just yeah. upload a bunch of photos to Walgreens. The prints are super cheap. You can get, you can get books, you can get mugs, you can get canvases. Mm -hmm. Just, and I think that's I, important. That's I got like some. the last step in, in having a good photo system uh, in this day and age is yeah, to make yeah. sure that you still get something physical to hang on the wall mm -hmm. or you know, whatever. <laughs> Amazon does prints now. Um, if you're a Prime member, they have discounted prints. Um, we have several photos on the wall that are just printed at Walgreens. So don't get too hung up on which service is the best. Um, just Just get it done would be my recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, Phil, we, uh, we have a question that came in last week. Someone heard our first show and, um, uh, his name was J Y and had some really nice things to say. Thank you so much, uh, for, for the nice things. He, he said he liked our podcast. Um, 
he thought uh, it was it was really useful for him. And he had a question. He said, um, and I'm quoting from him. He said, by the way, I'm pretty sure you mentioned your lenses, which I think we did. Uh, he said, but not your actual cameras. In particular, whether they're DX or FX uh, makes a big difference when talking about suggested lenses. So Phil, tell us in just like a minute about your cameras, the bodies that you use. Mm -hmm. um, well, my phone is uh, just a Galaxy Note 5. It's the one that doesn't explode. And I find that the camera on there is plenty good enough to get most shots. It's, it's in my pocket all the time. So mm -hmm. that's the camera I got with me. Okay. Now, as far as the DSLR, it's a Nikon D3200, which is not a modern, uh, modern is not the right word. It's not a current model camera. I think you can still buy them, but it's not the like this it's a great camera model. Um, and I have the kit lens that came with it, which is an 18 to 55. Um, I also have a 55 to 200 zoom lens, which I use for m taking sports photos, which I think we're talking about next time. We are indeed talking about sports and, photos. Uh, then I bought, those came with it. And then I bought a 35 millimeter prime lens on, yes. on Simon's suggestion. And I use that um, around the house, around the yard, that kind of thing. And it, in addition, I have um, a set of four close-up filters which I can yes. attach to any of those three lenses. Mostly I'll do, I won't use it on the, on the sports lens, but I'll use it on, on the other two. Um, and I'll use those for taking macro photos of, of bugs or flowers or, or that kind of thing. And that, yeah. that pretty much describes my whole setup. Those close-up filters about $35 for that set. Highly, highly recommend those. It's worth it. Such worth a good it. Purchase. Um, for me, I have a, a D200, it's a Nikon DX camera that I don't use anymore. I replace it with my D7100. I also have a D750, which is a full frame camera. And I use, uh, I, I got a I got a 35, 85, and 50 millimeter prime lenses. And I also have a 70 to 200 F2.8 lens, which we'll use, or which we'll talk about next week when we talk about the sports um, topic. And then I also have, uh, close-up filters as well. So I shoot both DX and FX, and we can talk about that in another show. But in general, either one works great. And uh, if you have a DX camera, a great lens is that 35 millimeter lens. If you have an FX camera, use that same 35 millimeter lens. It works. It's got some vignetting around the corners. Or get the 50 millimeter lens. Uh, both good choices. If you just want a general all-around lens. Sounds good. I've got a couple real quick things. Um, okay. We had a couple other people comment and give us some great feedback. I just want to shout out, thank them. Uh, D Welker sent in an email with some great feedback and some great comments. Um, Thothar, if I'm getting that right, also. Yeah. Um, some weirdo named Tom <laughs> called me, I think. <laughs> That's another one of our brothers. Um, Would that be Tom, then, our brother? There was a question here that I want you to address really quick. Uh, okay. It's from Thothar. Um, in regards to our Christmas photos, he says, last Christmas, uh, my photos were blurry because I was using slower shutter speed and the indoor Christmas evening, my kids were just moving all the time. My old Nikon D3000 has a maximum ISO of, ISO of 1600. So within these constraints, what would be your advice? Um, my advice is, is always sacrifice ISO if it means a faster shutter speed. Um, if you have to shoot at the upper limit of your camera's ISO to get a faster shutter speed, then do it. You can correct a grainy photo later on in Lightroom or even don't correct it. Um, but if it's if it's blurry because your kids are moving and you shot at one sixtieth of a second in order to get a, a properly exposed photo, you can't fix the blurriness. So my, um, my advice is always if, if you need to raise the ISO in order to get a faster shutter speed, do it. Don't sacrifice, uh, don't get a blurry photo. And, uh, one other good trick is to, if you're shooting at high ISO, 1600, 3200, even 6400, make your photos black and white in post, um, convert it in Google Photos or Lightroom or something like that, and the graininess sort of disappears, and it gives your photos a, a more classic look. But black and white hides some of the artifacts of 
grainy photos. Um, but yeah, that that's my advice. If you're looking for it, shoot at higher ISO. If it maxes out at 1600, go all there and don't worry about it because you'll still get a, 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 a photo of your kids that is free of motion blur. That's a good answer. I like that. And I like Thank that idea about going black and white on those too. I'm going to probably try that myself. So, well, thanks, uh, Phil. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. So thank too, you. Huh? This is a good show. Thanks everybody for listening and sending in your feedback. If you have I any really feedback on, you guys. on this thank you. show um, or questions for our next show, which is going to be about sports photography uh, and photographing our kids uh, on the soccer field or the basketball court or the unicycle arena <laughs> or what have you. Um, or even biking around the neighborhood, but yeah, anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, on next time. So if you have questions or comments about that, uh, go ahead and send them to us. Um, cameradads.com is the website. You can do that. There's a box on there where you can send us messages. Um, you can send us tweets at cameradads. Uh, main email is cameradads at gmail.com. And I think that just about covers it. All right. Sounds good, Phil. We'll see you next month. All right. Have a good night. You too.